as we look at different areas of the financial statements, I always like to find some tools that I can share with you for analyzing a company's health. Is this company operating efficiently? Is it doing a good job? Is it generating a profit? Is there a reasonable chance that it will stay in business for the next year? Things like that. Now, as we look at liabilities, there are a number of metrics that I could throw out there for you to take a look at, but I'd like to explore some of the most common. And arguably, two of the most common are the current ratio and working capital. These both help us assess liquidity for an organization. Anytime I'm talking about liquidity, what we're talking about is the short-term health of the organization. You see, liquid assets flow easily. Cash is the king of liquid assets. It's the most liquid asset. If you owe money to somebody, they will be happy if you give them cash. You certainly could satisfy a liability with other types of assets, but at the end of the day, people like cash. So when we talk about analyzing a company's liquidity, we're looking at what liquid resources do they have, what resources within the next 12 months or the operating cycle. Uh, so let's just take a look at this very basic example. Current assets, let's just assume that we look at all the current assets of the business. That could be cash, accounts receivable, as long as they're current, inventory, prepaid expenses. You kind of get the gist. Current assets are things that are either cash, are expected to be converted to cash within the next year, or expected to be consumed within the next year. Now, flip that around, current liabilities, current liabilities, and in this case, I'm just gonna assume it's 200,000. These are going to require cash within the next year. Things like accounts payable, the current portion of a company's long-term debt, maybe a current note payable, maybe some accrued expenses or some other payables. Income tax payable comes to mind. You get the gist here. And you can start to see how this information will help us analyze the short-term health of the company. Because you see, if you have $600,000 in current assets at the end of a particular year, and your current liabilities are only 200,000, that means your current ratio is 3.0, which is pretty healthy current ratio. It means you have three times as many current assets as current liabilities. That means that you could have some pretty severe hiccups on the top side, or you could have some skeletons show up come out of the closet and surprise you on the, on the denominator, and you'd still probably be in a pretty safe position. Now, the current ratio only tells one part of the story. I mean, look at it this way. You could have a current ratio, if you had current assets of $3, and you had current liabilities of $1, you'd have a current ratio of 3.0, but you would only have $2 of working capital as we look down here. So two scenarios produce the same current ratio. That's why it's important to also have a measurement of working capital, which is simply the difference between your current assets and your current liabilities. See, this helps you with the magnitude of, of uh, the difference between those two. So if you take a look at this, I mean, which situation would you prefer? Current ratio of 3.0, but with working capital of $2? Or would you rather see a current ratio of 3.0 and working capital of $400,000? I know that you can tell which of these situations is safer, which is more comfortable. And you can start to see how we can use either one of these metrics to analyze a company's liquidity. I'd like to point out two things while I'm thinking about it. Um, it's important to look at these trends over time. I mean, if you look at this, you say, is current ratio, and current ratio is three. Is that good or bad? Well, on the surface, I can tell you it looks pretty good. Anything greater than one is starting to look favorable, but is it good enough? Well, in order for me to answer that question, I would like to see what the current ratio was in the previous year and maybe the year before that and even the year before that. What if you had a five-year trend of current ratios and you could see what the current ratio has been doing over the past five years? What if you see that it's 3.0 today, but five years ago, it used to be six? Then you start to wonder, hmm, what's going on there? Was six an anomaly or 
is three, does three mean that we're not using our resources effectively? That trend will help tell a story. Also, what is an industry benchmark? Find your industry, find statistics about your industry. There are, sometimes you can find information on the internet. There are other proprietary sources you could consult as well. But wouldn't it be helpful to know if your competitors have a current ratio, let's say of four or five typically, and you have 3.0, you start to wonder, what am I doing that the competitors are not doing or vice versa, what are they doing that we're not doing? It helps you set a threshold and you can evaluate your own performance. We can get some additional information about liquidity by looking at this particular liability, accounts payable. It's a current liability, that's why I put it in our discussion of liquidity as far as analysis. Now, accounts payable, if you've seen uh, any of my discussions about current assets, you probably saw an accounts receivable turnover ratio. And we also had something in the accounts receivable discussion where we talked about uh, the average number of days it takes a company to collect its receivables. This is really the liabilities and expense counterpart of the accounts receivable turnover ratio. And not unlike with the AR turnover, we're going to have an item on the income statement divided by some elements from the balance sheet. We see that a lot of times with ratios, not all of them, but plenty of them, where we're taking, in this case, this is an income statement expense. I know it doesn't have the word expense in its name, but it's generally conceived to be uh, one of the most fundamental expenses that a company can incur because you see accounts payable usually is used to incur liabilities and purchase things with our suppliers, with our vendors. Uh, a lot of times that becomes part of our cost of goods sold. And then average accounts payable down here, this is on the balance sheet, it's a current liability. Now before we do all the calculations, I want to talk about this average for just a second. Anytime you see an average, uh, you can simply take the beginning balance and the ending balance and, and take the average of those two. Okay, so if we said that uh, uh, AP at 1231, 2017, so at the end of the previous year, accounts payable was $80,000. And then fast forward, here's the end of the current year and the AP is $100,000. So you see what we're doing here? It's, we're gonna take a look at the average accounts payable for the year. It's gonna be our beginning plus our ending divided by two. When we measure the cost of goods sold, it's going to be for the 2018 calendar year. Right? So this is gonna be the 12 months, January through December. What was that expense for the whole year of 2018? And then the average liability is going to be, it's kind of like a sandwich. This is the meat in the middle or whatever fillings in your sandwich. And here are the two slices of bread, right? The beginning liability, the ending liability. If you add these, you can see the total is $180,000. Divide that by two and you will get an average accounts payable of $90,000. Of course, I made the numbers simple. You can just honestly eyeball that $90,000 is exactly halfway in between these two numbers. But for more complicated math, what you want to do is take the beginning and the ending, add them up, divide by two, and that gives you your average accounts payable over here. So average accounts payable, $90,000. Let's assume that cost of goods sold for the 2018 calendar year is $270,000. And you can see that uh, we're going to have an AP turnover of 3.0. Okay. I'm just going to give a little circle to that one. We've got a lot of things on the board, but uh, let me point out what's happening here. Is what this means is we, it's, it's as if we, we purchase things from our vendors and then we pay them. And we purchase more and then we pay them. And we purchase more and we pay them. And we do that three times during the calendar year. So the question would be, is that good or bad? And sometimes with a turnover ratio, it's not always evident, right? Is that good to, to pay your bills three times a year? 
Seems a little low to me, but let's, uh, let's take that turnover ratio, bring it on down here. And if you divide that, because that's kind of like gymnastics, right? How many times during the year you're doing this? Take that, divide into 365 days, and we see that the average payment period, and I'm just going to round to the nearest whole, whole day, is 122 days, roughly. So, and that kind of makes sense. I mean, there's 365 days in a year. If we're cycling through our payables three times each year, then on average, it's taking us a third of a year or 122 days to pay our bills. And I would argue that uh, from, from one standpoint, that's very attractive because it means that we're using our cash wisely. We are delaying payments. So if we can, if we can wait to pay a bill, then we can use that money for other things to control our debt load, to maybe save some interest, maybe to invest in something um, and earn some returns elsewhere. There are all sorts of things. Companies have no difficulty coming up with things to do with cash typically, but the risk is this. Even though a lower turnover ratio for current liabilities and a longer number of days may be appealing it could damage our relationship with our vendors and suppliers. So you have to be very careful with that. I don't know too many suppliers that want to wait four months to get paid. Uh, we're probably not going to get the best deals with them. They may even stop supplying things to us if we take this long to pay them. So with the accounts payable turnover ratio, lower is better within reason. With the average payment period, longer is better within reason. And the qualification of within reason is yeah, as long as we're not damaging our relationships with our vendors, as long as we're, we're treating them with the respect that we would expect to get treated with from our customers. If you lent money to a company, would you be curious if they were generating at least enough profit to pay the interest payments to you? I think you can see where we're going with this. You see, uh, when a company when a company borrows money, the lender is primarily concerned with this question. Can the company repay the principal with interest? Will they have the liquidity to make those payments? And one of the metrics is up here on the screen. Now, don't let the math become too daunting here. All we're doing with this is, if you look at the numerator, we have net income. Forget about the rest of this for a minute. In fact, let me just cross it out for just a second. Let's ignore this. And we'll ignore this. And if you look at what I've left, it's net income divided by interest expense. So in other words, how much profit are they generating relative to the interest payments that they have to make to our, our bank if the bank is if, if it's a bank that is the lender? That's all we're doing with the times interest earned ratio is bigger is better, bigger is safer for the lender. Uh, but then we have to take a couple of things into account here because you see we don't want interest expense to be part of that net income uh, because uh, interest expense is what we're trying to cover down here. Also, um, that we may at some point want to compare this metric for companies that don't borrow any money. Maybe their capital structure is different. They are funded with owner's equity instead of external debt. And in that case, a company without any external debt is not going to have interest expense. So we can essentially level the playing field by eliminating interest expense. So it's going to make the net income bigger, but what we're basically doing is we're saying, what would the net income have been if the company did not incur this interest expense? Kind of just adjusting the net income just for purposes of this metric. And then uh, interest expense is typically tax deductible. So let's get rid of the income tax expense as well. And that really starts to level the playing field. Now we're measuring something that is closer to operating income and then dividing that by interest expense. That's going to help us get rid of the, the impact of interest expense on net income. It also helps us evaluate this particular metric for companies that may have differing capital structures. Let's run through an actual calculation. Let's assume that the company generated net income of $160,000 this year. However, they did incur interest expense of $10,000. Okay. So in other words, 
if they had not incurred that interest expense, their net income would have been $170,000. We're going to get rid of that interest expense for purposes of this one metric. And their income tax expense for this particular year is $30,000. And you might already be seeing, like I like to do with these videos, um, this is going to come out to a nice $200,000. So before income tax expense and before interest expense, we have $200,000 of income. That's probably a close surrogate to our company's operating income. And then we already know the interest expense. We just have to put it back down here. And we get to do a little bit of math here. So we basically have, what do we have in the numerator? $200,000. And then in the denominator, we have 10,000 bucks. That gives us a times interest ratio of 20.0. And that's a really healthy times interest earned ratio. Think about what that means. It's basically saying that our income is 20 times greater than our interest expense. Very safe. Many creditors consider a times interest earned ratio of, let's say, roughly 2.5 to be acceptable, to be an acceptable risk. So if we have 20.0, that, that is phenomenal. But still, just like with any metric, I would like to see what this was, uh, what its performance was over time. I'd like to see what has the times interest earned ratio been over the past three, four, or five years. I would also like to see what is a a benchmark for similar companies in this same industry. That's what you want to do with financial statement analysis. Financial statements can tell you stories. You just need to know where to look to see those stories. And one of the ways to uncover the tale that can be told is to look at trends over time and also to compare yourself to your peers by looking at those industry benchmarks, sometimes called industry averages. We looked at some ways to analyze liabilities that help us evaluate liquidity. Now let's take a look at solvency. If liquidity is the company's short-term health, solvency is the assessment of the company's long-term viability. And there are a number of ratios we could analyze, but arguably the two major are debt to equity and debt to total assets. Let's just do the calculations, then we'll talk about them for a minute. So let's say that this company has total liabilities of 400,000. And I'm gonna calculate both of these metrics simultaneously. Now notice that this is total liabilities, not just your current liability. This is everything, current and long-term. That's why when we looked at the current ratio, we only looked at current liabilities because we were trying to analyze the short-term health, the liquidity. This is the long-term viability of the enti entity. Will this entity be around in 5, 10, 20 years or longer? So we look at total liabilities. Now for the debt to equity ratio, we're basically saying, and uh, let's see, our, our total stockholders equity in this example is gonna be 600,000. What we're basically saying is, asking this question, how much of this company was capitalized from outside sources? How much of it came from the owners, okay? How much skin in the game do the owners have? Well, if you look at this ratio, the math comes out to 0.67, but what does that mean? It means that for every dollar invested by the owners, this company borrowed 0.67 or 67 cents, okay? So that's not bad, lower is better, certainly. Uh, what about debt to total assets? Well, those of you who are astute might be thinking about the accounting equation. You know that assets are equal to liabilities plus stockholders' equity. So even without me telling you that this company had a million dollars in total assets, you should be able to figure it out based upon the accounting equation. So what we have here, the math is pretty straightforward. It's 0 0.40 or 0.4. What we're basically saying is for every dollar of assets, we have 40 cents of, of liabilities. With both of these metrics, lower is safer. I hesitate to say that lower is better because that would imply that debt is bad. Debt is not inherently bad. Uncontrolled debt, debt at an unsustainable level is bad, uh, can be unhealthy. So there are healthy levels of debt, there are unhealthy levels of debt. Um, and controlled debt uh, can be useful, almost essential to an organization. If you talk to a finance professor, they may talk about leverage. 
Uh, the concept that if you borrow money, let's say uh, I'm just going to make up an interest rate, 4 or 5%, and then you use those funds to generate a return of 10 12% or something greater, you have taken advantage of leverage, and that can be a great thing. But of course, if you over leverage the company, that lever that helped you out on the upside can come back and swing back and hit you in the head, and it can really hurt when there are bad things happening. So leverage extends your power, the, extends the power of the dollar, and it can work in your favor, but, but it can really swing back and it can hurt the company. That's why I say, okay, lower is safer here, okay? Uh, you want to look at these trends over time. You want to take a look at industry averages, certainly, and understanding that some level of debt is good, but you want to make sure that you're going to be able to make these payments and to repay these loans, these obligations, as they arise.